when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. Clarence McCartney, an old preacher, had a way of making his sermons using questions. And I love the questions that he used to bring us into what he wanted to talk about. He will ask questions like, what is the weakest word? What is the word that is weakest because it is the most useless? What is the word that men speak in sad reverie when they have left opportunity to pass them by? What is the word men use when they have chosen a course of life and then are unhappy at the choice? What is the word that strikes the notes of hopeless remorse and sorrow when men have made their bed and then find that they must lie upon it? What is the word that falls in distress from the lips of a mother as she stands over the still form of her dead child? What is the word that men speak with accents of grief when they discover that while they slept in careless neglect, those they love have been taken from them. And now their ears are sealed in all their passionate words of affection, which wait too long for expression. What is the word that Joab put into the mouth of David when he was mourning over the death of Absalom? What is the word Balaam used when the angel of the Lord stopped him in his sinful path? What is the word that the sisters at Bethany used when Christ came to see them? What is the word that is the short, true, but sad and hopeless epitaph on thousands of graves? What is the word that is cut over are the porters of the, of the city of the lost. And then he said, that word is if. Second Samuel chapter 19 verse 6. The story of David and Absalom. And Job comes to him after David had mourned for Absalom. He wasn't concerned about the people that were dying just about his son and so Job came because you love those who hate you and hate those who love you for you have made it clear today that commanders and servants are nothing to you for today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today then you would be pleased man that is what Job said to David. Job must be a very brave man indeed. That word is the weakest word because it is the most useless. What did an if ever do for God or for man? If breaks no chains or, or of evil habits, it means no flaws in men's character. If never brings back a lost opportunity and never opens a door that neglect or sin has closed. If never brings back a day that has been lost. If never armed one for the battle of life. If never preached a sermon, wrote a book, build a house, invent an engine, plow the field or conquer the city. If never opened the doors of death and brought back the life that was gone. If never turned the soul to repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus. Let's take a look at David's if for a moment. In 2 Samuel chapter 19. If Absalom had lived, this was an if 
which was spoken by Joab. Remember, Joab is the man who led um, David's army. And David's army are more or less running from Absalom. They are fighting from, for, um, for, for Absalom. Absalom is David's son who tried to wrest the kingdom away from his father. And so David's men and Absalom's men met in battle. But at this time, David is only concerned. He is waiting for some word to come about what happened in the battle. And all he's concerned about is his son. Remember, he is commander-in-chief. He is responsible for those men going to war. And his concern is about a son who has disgraced him, disgraced the throne, disgraced the entire nation. This word spoken by Joab to David is a word that says to David, you are thinking wrong. It's a, it's a word that says to David, man, you are not concerned about what really is important here, whether or not we win this battle. Yes, this was spoken by Job at the conclusion of one of the most moving scenes in the Bible, or for that matter, out of it. As the troops marched out that morning to battle in the woods of Ephraim against Absalom's rebel host, David charged each of his captains, Itai, Abishai, and Job, as they marched by with the veteran divisions to deal, that's what David says, deal gently with Absalom. That was his only concern. It, it doesn't matter to David what Absalom had been, what he had done. It doesn't matter that this boy was also involved in murder. It didn't matter to him. All his concern was deal gently with Absalom. Full of affection for his black guard son, David is fearful lest he should be slain in the battle. He says, deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. Listen. But when Joab saw Absalom hanging there under the oak, caught by the luxurious hair of which he was so proud, he thought more of the safety of the kingdom than he did of, jo of David's sorrow. And taking three darts, he thrust them through the heart of the hapless Absalom. Sometimes you got to do some things. Now the reason for this lesson today, as we face this new year, we are remembering all the promises we made last day. And we are saying to ourselves, if I had done this, if I had accomplished this, we have, we're making all these statements. It's time to stop the ifs. It's time to face reality. God never asked us to make promises for next year or for the new year. All God wants from us is our decision to be faithful to him but then we begin to make promises going back to David all through the hours of the long day when the battle was raging David sat between the gates of the city waiting for some news while the watchman on the roof over the gate kept a lookout for runners who would bring news of the battle Imagine the king. Imagine as he sits, waiting for news. In those days, there were this, these guys who, who, who were messengers. And these messengers would come from the battle. They would run with news to the king. And David is looking for those runners to come to bring him news. Not about the battle but about his son. And remember who this son was. This is no angel. Far from that. 
This is the worst of the worst. A man who would run and chase his father away from the throne because he wanted to be king. So here comes Ahimaaz. Approaching this city. When David learned who it was, his heart was full of hope. For he said, he is a good man and he comes with good tidings. He's going to bring me some good news. But this man had not learned what had happened in the battle of Ephraim. All he knew was that the army of Absalom had been defeated. And when David saw it, his first question was, is the young man Absalom safe? Now, taken outside of the context, it's a wonderful question. But used within the context of what is happening, it's a bad question because it is showing that he didn't care about others who were faithful to him, good soldiers who were fighting on his behalf. He cared nothing about them but for the son. So all that Ahimaaz could answer was, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. Maybe his heart at this time is not that bad because this man didn't see anything about his son. So David told him to turn aside and he was waiting for the coming of the second runner. This runner, Cushi or Cushai, knew that Absalom had been slain. Listen. When David said to him, is the young man Absalom safe? Cushi replied, he says, the enemies of my lord, the king, and all that rise up against me to, the, to do the herd, be as the young man is. Uh-oh. Here come the news he was not waiting for. And this man is pretty, pretty good, don't you think? He says, the enemies are all dead. But so also is Absalom. How is David supposed to respond to this? When he heard this, he, he, he threw his mantle over his head, went up to the chamber over the gate to weep alone. And as he went, he said, now just imagine a mother, an old mother with her hand on her head as she cries for her son who either is dead or has just gone to jail. Oh, my son Absalom, oh, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Just maybe David is asking the right question at the wrong time. Maybe he should have been asking this question when he was sleeping with Bathsheba. Maybe he should have been asking this question when he caused Uriah to die. But now that boy, the product of his sinfulness, is dead. Why is he crying? I don't know. But maybe we can say, poor David. The sorrow that overwhelmed him had banished all thought of his kingdom and his power and prestige as a ruler. Think on that for a moment. He forgot who he was. What his responsibilities were. He forgot that he was king. Sometime, this is not the first time that David forgot who he was. Remember when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought in and David stripped himself and started dancing in front of the people? He forgot who he was. This was an emotional man. He forgot who he was at this time. But here comes sometimes we don't like it. But somebody has to bring us back to ground zero. Somebody has to say to us, your reasoning is wrong. So Job 
Now, Job was not an easy guy. Job was a man who liked to take revenge too. If you remember um, Abner. When David welcomed Abner back into the fold and Joab didn't like it, he said, Abner was the man over Saul's army and Joab the man over David's army. When Abner came and reunited and bring him back under David, Joab didn't like that. So after David had made a plan with Abner, had brought him back in, one day Joab came in from the field and he saw this and he was mad. So what did he do? He called Abner out. Out of the city. Walked with him. Talked with him. And as soon as they get out of the city, Abner, or Joab killed him. And David at that time said to, to, to the rest of the folk, he says, Abner died like a fool. I wish you'd remember this. Why did Abner die like a fool? Because he was in the city of refuge. And he allowed somebody to talk him out of the city. See, when you are in the city of refuge, whatever you have done in the past, all is gone. But when you enter out of that city or you leave that city, your blood is on your own shoulders. And so Joab killed him. Joab is not an easy guy. We just want to say a thing about him. So at this time, Joab saw David. And Joab doesn't like what David is doing. Because David has forgotten he is king. He has forgotten that he is responsible for the lives of all the soldiers. And now he is all up in Absalom. Sometimes we forget too. We forget what we are about. It is true that we have sons and we have daughters. And sometimes they mess up. And when somebody tries to correct them, we instead of thinking of the church as a whole for which Christ died, we are only thinking of that one child who has gone astray. And we will do anything and everything to protect that child even in his or her sins. That's what David is doing. And that's what Job is accusing him of. And he is right. So Job calls this, or we will call this, an intemperate grief. Told him in his unrestrained mourning for Absalom, he had forgotten the brave men who fought and died for him on the field of battle that he might be restored to the throne. Listen, listen, listen. Listen to Job. For I perceive that if Absalom had lived, then that would have pleased you well, pleased you well if Absalom had lived. But Absalom is dead. What are you going to do about that? Isn't this a different David as to that first child? that was born of Bathsheba? You remember? That while the child was sick, David didn't eat anything but sat in mourning and after the child was dead, David got up and eat, refreshed himself. He says, there's nothing I can do. He can come to me, but I can go to him. This is a different David we're seeing now. This is a different David. So brought to himself by Job's gruff but sensible remark and timely too, David composed himself, came out of the chamber where he was mourning and took his royal seat at the gate of the city where all his army could see him and salute him. If you could go back to some of your actions, some of your words, and all of us wish that, would they have been the same? Now we have taken time to think about them. Would they have been the same? Or are we still in that kind of mourning and that grief that we cannot see beyond the tragedy? Intemperate sorrow 
until corrected by Joab, unfitted David for his great responsibilities as a king. I want us to get that point. While David is in this sorrow, now there's nothing wrong in sorrowing for your child, but then you have a responsibility as a mother, as a father for other children. And what's the message? Those of you who have two or three children, remember the one who messed up, the one with whom you spent all that time? Think of what the others are thinking. Think of what the other children are thinking. And think of what they might be saying to themselves. To get your attention, maybe I have to do something wrong. To get your atten attention like this other child, I have to do something wrong. That maybe may get your attention. And that's what Joab is shown David. The fact is that David, giving himself over to his grief, was thinking of life as it might have been. And of the kingdom as it might have been if Absalom lived. But Absalom was dead. That Job correctly discerned was the present principle of David's life. In that sublime and touching moment and that cry, Oh Absalom my son, would God I had died for thee. You can read also the cadence of his sorrowful thought. Think, if Absalom had only lived, if he had not been slain in the, in the midst of battle, but it was a vain and a useless if. All of us have said though, that have made those ifs, haven't we? We have said it many times, but have we looked back and, and, and look at them and said, why did I say that? What lessons did I teach others? In making those statements. Listen. Absalom was dead. David's sorrow could not bring him back. All that his unrestrained grief now did. Was to unfit him for his work as a king. That pitiful if of David. Has been echoed and re-echoed for many a sorrowing and bereaved soul. The amount of funerals I have been a part of personally. And I've heard some stuff. The amount of statements I have heard even in my office. And then death comes and we hear the cry. And somebody has said, if I didn't do this, if I didn't say those words, if... And I can see the cry. Have you ever been in the room at the hospital when someone is pronounced dead and then the family comes in and somebody breaks down and began to say words that they didn't think about? I've been there. And I have had to take people out of the rooms just to get them not to say that because others are listening. You don't want to say that. Because somebody might have the wrong interpretation. And I've seen that. Those of you in TV land, you've all had a good season. You have made promises and now as you enter the new year, you make promises about what you're going to do. But remember, the ifs. Remember what you plan to do and never get done. And then you say, man, if I had thought this, but the one thing that you don't think of, if I had turned my life over to God, but you didn't. I have been to funerals where family all remain quiet because they wished had been a wish my husband or my wife, my son or my daughter had turned to Jesus. 
Some folks are crying. You and I don't know why. Because they know that this person is lost and lost forever. And sometimes they are burning on the inside and they said, if I had been a better example, if I had taught him the gospel, if I had not been cursing so much, maybe this person would have changed his or her life. What, I mean, what a sad word, if. If I have wounded any soul today, if I have caused one soul to go astray, please, Lord, forgive. You don't have to live with ifs. You can live with certainty. You can live with assurance. Knowing that God is willing to forgive you, you don't have to be like David if David if had gone wrong more than four generations ago now he is paying the price for his sin what about you don't tell me that you haven't paid the price when you uttered when you utter the word if See, that word if never stands alone. Listen. Maybe there's something in your heart today that tells you, that is saying to you, I'm not ready to give my life for Jesus. I'm not ready to surrender. Please avoid that word if because tomorrow... It's not going to get any easier if there's a tomorrow. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get any easier. It's going to get more difficult. When you reject the Lord today, tomorrow is not going to be any easier, my friends. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation when your father tempted me, saw my works. Yet they died in the wilderness. Thousands, if not millions, died in the wilderness because of if. If we had been back in Egypt, we won't be suffering what we're suffering now. If I didn't get married, I wouldn't be going through this junk. If I didn't have any children, but you are married and you have children, stop the ears and do what God says you ought to do. If I hadn't been all these years in this denomination, stop the ears and get out. Because when you're dead, you, it's all gone. There is no change. There is no purgatory. So why don't you come to Christ? Surrender to him. And he is the one who enables you to leave that word out of your vocabulary in the context of today's lesson. You believe in Christ? Wonderful. Are you willing to change your life in repentance? Better still. Are you willing to be baptized for the remission of your sins having confessed Christ? You better do it today because tomorrow will only be if. And if has no certainty at all. It's a mirage. There is no water there. You are in the desert of sin. It's time to get out. Why not come today as together we stand and sing? I am without.